Freeman Dyson, uh, I believe, has written a new book uh, that Ramachandran was talking about, and uh, perhaps we'll get to hear more about it. But in one of his earlier works, and I think Joel knows Freeman Dyson too, in one of his earlier books, he said that uh, every experiment, in a sense, that you do forces a subatomic particle to make a choice. Is that true? Would you agree with that statement? There's, uh, quantum theory is uh, nothing more than uh, choices that are made through and observations. So who makes those choices? Um, ultimately, the, the observing self. But there are many people here, physicists, who say that um, that's all quantum physics, that's Copenhagen. There are at least 11 other interpretations of quantum physics, and somehow we can do away with uh, with the observer or consciousness uh, in those other theories? Um, I would be very happy if we could get rid of that observer. <laughs> um, because um, indeed, um, as a scientist, we can't really account for it. So in some ways, um, it would be good so to get rid of it. But I've come to the conclusion that we cannot get rid of it. It is there from the beginning to the very end. It is with us and it will always be with us. And for us to deny it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Denial doesn't mean that you don't poof away. You don't say, okay, you disappear. I can deny you, I can say, Deepak, you don't exist. But you exist, you know you exist. So denial doesn't really mean that takes away the existence of certain things. And I think the, you know, our eye awareness is the deepest reality. Yeah, but again, in Eastern wisdom traditions, the I, you know, if I say I, you use the word I too. But if I go inside the body, there's no I there. That's right. Right? It, uh, I go there, there's no such thing as an inner I witnessing yeah. awareness. So in Eastern wisdom traditions, the I itself is also a qualia within consciousness. But the I that I'm talking about is the deep levels of awareness that are beyond objective reality. Beyond the subject-object Be, Beyond the subject-object. So ultimately, the complementarities I was referring to, it is through those complementarities and through these observations that the universe manifests. But ultimately, the other side is the involution. And then, eventually, you reach a level that objects don't exist. That is called the witness consciousness. So the witness consciousness is, and I think we can sort of have a little hint if we maybe take a little experiment with the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll ask everybody to just um, make yourself comfortable and close your eyes for just a couple of minutes. And if any thoughts are coming and going, that's fine. Now, between the breaths, just follow your breath, but between the breaths, as the breath comes in and the breath comes out, there's a moment of silence. Just focus on that between in-breath and out-breath. And as you do, you will notice that the thoughts begin to dissolve away. Maybe not right away. It doesn't matter, just follow the breath. They say that space between the in-breath and the out-breath ultimately is the witness consciousness that we will talk about. We can open our eyes. It's a simple exercise. You can do it at home. If there is a witness consciousness, then it must apply at every level. It cannot be an esoteric, mystical thing that exists somewhere else. It has to be here and now. So no one, I believe, will deny their own breath. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what I would call cosmic consciousness. Can it's we try time. something else? As you're listening to me right now, all of you, just turn your attention to who's listening.
That's the witness consciousness. Yeah. So would you say that's in the discontinuity, that's in the space between space-time events? It is from that space that space-time events arise. And they dissolve back to into so I was recently at the Max Planck Institute, and yeah. somebody there was no longer using the word subatomic particles. They were calling them haps, happenings in happenings. consciousness. So a subatomic particle is a space-time event in consciousness. That's right. Would you be sympathetic uh, to that? Absolutely, notion? absolutely. It was Heraclitus, ancient Greece, who, who was one of the first philosophers who talked about everything moves. And he was talking about the process as being reality, not hard particles of Democritus, not the atoms. They don't exist. In and a even, way, when you observe something, yeah. you kind of freeze the, freeze the movement of consciousness. You, it's an artifact, isn't it? You freeze the frame. But when, as soon as you observe something, it has changed. Our, our cells, as you know, change. Within seven years, every cell in our body has, has changed, and only a few brain cells last for a lifetime. Not all of them, but... So what keeps this awareness, what keeps this wholeness in the body if the very cells of our body change all the time? It's a computer. If you want to use the analogy of computer, it's a computer that continuously invents itself. We have not built a computer like that yet, because the, the hardware in our computer is always there, right? It's the programs, programs that change. But in our case, the hardware itself changes. OK, we're going to run out of time, because we have lots of other very interesting discussions. But uh, I just want to ask you two questions. Uh, one is uh, the BEM experiments that you're involved with. Uh, yes. Could you explain a little bit about them? Um, the BEM experiments were done by uh, BEM. Uh, it's a, re a retired uh, professor at um, Cornell. Uh, there's nine, nine of them, and uh, actually he uh, published again uh, six of them. Very interesting. Basically, um, one of the experiments I'll just describe, I think it was number nine. Uh, subjects who were really students at Cornell were asked to um, not study for an exam. They're, they were told they were going to take an exam, okay, but they're not going to study an exam. So they took the exam, and then half of them, I believe, they were asked to study for the exam. And the other half never study. The ones who study the exam for the exam after they had taken the test actually turned out they did better in the test that they had already taken. You understand? So it is like a retrocausal. It is like the future is entangled with the past. Now, I think um, Henry Staff will tell us a little bit about it more, and I also agree with Henry. I don't think it changes the hour of time, I think the, at least in the physical sense. But it, there is a, a, a causal component, perhaps it is the principle of sufficient reason, which says that things happen because they have a meaning that enters the picture. In any case, uh, whatever the explanation, Bem's experiment, are very, very intriguing. And again, it is the interface between psychology and physical systems that I was talking about, where the measurement in a psychological sense seems to be very, very important. And if indeed those experiments are held up, and I understand that eight, out, eight other experiments have been done, eight out of nine, and they are all confirmed, uh, those that have will have profound implications. So talk about, just for a second, the arrow of time. Uh, is there an explanation in the laws of physics for the arrow of time? There is an explanation for the arrow of time in terms of even uh, classical uh, thermodynamics. Basically, it arises because of the uh, second law of thermodynamics, uh, because of processes uh, that take place, the uh, increase of the entropy, so to speak, which give you a direction of time. At the quantum level, uh, time can go in either direction. In fact, there is a theory by Aharonov uh, that you can have two arrows going back. And in fact, I, it was um, uh, Dirac himself who believed in two arrows of time because of the, you know, a positron can be considered as a, as a particle running back in time. So at the quantum level, time doesn't seem to have a preferred direction. At the cosmic level, it seems to have a direction. Now, these BAM experiments 
throw that whole idea of time into a little bit of a question, and I think we have to have a lot more thinking about it. Stuart uh, attended a workshop at Google on quantum biology. Yeah. Is it time to start thinking in terms of quantum biology? Quantum biology, yes. I had some slides, and maybe we'll talk about them tonight. Um, quantum biology um, is the emerging field. I would say that, in my view, biology perhaps is even more fundamental than physics. I, it's hard for me to say that because I'm a physicist. <laughs> but um, it, it looks like in the reductionistic approach that building up, remember I showed you the scales, building up from the, uh, all the way from the atoms or even below that the, the particles and maybe even the superstrings all the way to molecules that eventually give you DNA to get biological systems to work, it just, there's nothing in physics, there's nothing in the, in the dynamical laws of physics that will give you that. Well, I was thinking the other day, and perhaps this is too reductionist, and we'll close with this, yeah. but life is biology, would you agree? Life is biology. And would you agree that biology is chemistry? Biology is chemistry. Would you agree that chemistry is physics? Uh, and, and I know where you're going, it's uh, strings, et cetera, and of course, ultimate is vibrations. Well, I was going to go a little slowly. <laughs> Would you agree that physics is quantum mechanics? Yes. Would you agree that quantum mechanics is mathematics? Um, I would take quantum mechanics into vibrations, and then I would go to mathematics, yes. And would you say that mathematics is in consciousness? I would say mathematics and consciousness, and therefore, ultimately, perhaps, all of this is, is in a platonic realm, and maybe Plato was right, after all. Thank you, Dr. <laughs>